Hey, Ballard Church, I'm so glad you decided to join us this Sunday. It is Easter Sunday. Man, you could not have picked a better Sunday to join us, whether you're with us every week online or in person, or this is brand new to you and someone sent it your way. I'm so glad you decided to take a little bit of time. For us at church, this is a big weekend. This is really the Super Bowl. Our team spends a lot of time getting prepared for both our online and our in-person services, so I hope you're enjoying it the way God truly intended, with a bag of jelly beans next to you, proverbially Starburst. Those are the best. And maybe a few chocolate eggs, a little bit of cat Cadbury in your life, whatever it may be, I hope you're enjoying this, whether alone or with your family. I think you picked a great Sunday to join us. With it being such a big Sunday, maybe you're this way when you have a looming work project, maybe something circled in the calendar that you know is going to be an especially challenging week, uh, that you just plan a little bit of time to unplug. I know my wife and I do this every year. We take one day in the week leading up to Easter, and we just take a break. We relax, and we take one night away for a dinner without our kids. And oh my gosh, do I look forward to that dinner. If you have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is a precious commodity. It's a chance to just exhale, to gather your thoughts, to unplug from kind of the grind of life, and just enjoy each other. So we had some friends, we were telling about this, and they were like, you have to go to this one restaurant. It is absolutely unbelievable. It's the best food we've ever had, the ambiance, the everything. I mean, they were hyping this place. They were saying, man, you haven't tasted food till you've tasted this food. It is the best food you're ever going to have in your life. I mean, everything from the water to dessert, it is just going to blow your socks off. You're going to ask for the chef at the end, and Jesus is going to walk out from the kitchen. You're going to go, now it finally makes sense. It is that good of food. So we were excited. We went, we ordered, and it was mediocre. It was okay at best, and maybe I'm snobby, whatever. It was good, but it wasn't unbelievable. And I don't know about you, but maybe you've had that experience before. And my guess is that you have, because I'm not going to tell you the name of the restaurant, but I know what you're thinking in your head. You're thinking, I bet they went to blank. Because you had the same experience. You thought it was going to be unbelievable, and it just, something didn't quite hit right. Maybe you've had this experience with a TV show where it just didn't meet your expectations. Everyone else loved it. You got two episodes in. You just thought, I am not getting into this. I'm just going to go back to my tried and true show that I watch all the time, whatever it may be for you. I don't know what it is for you, but I think we've all had those experiences where We had so much hope, and we had so much expectation, and on the other side of it, it just seemed to flounder. It just seemed like something missed. And if we take that concept and we really put it into the lens of the Bible, and really ultimately why we're gathered here today, if we put that into the story of Jesus, I think especially as you approach Easter, and this is such a central theme. I mean, Jesus built up all this expectation. He was an unbelievable teacher. There were crowd gathers everywhere. There was his core group of followers that ultimately got to the point where they bought in so much that they left everything and followed him. They were confused, they were skeptical, but they saw things that would change the world. They heard Jesus teach things that no one expected, things that absolutely blew their mind, that changed cultures, that turned things upside down, that really shifted the way that people approached God. I mean, they figured Jesus would be the figure known as the Messiah. They thought that he was going to be the one that was foretold of, that would help save the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, and bring right relationship again with God. They had built up this expectation even to the fact that finally Jesus enters into the capital in this triumphant moment. There's crowds that are gathered, and they're thinking, finally, this is our moment. This is our moment where things change, where he establishes himself as king. We kind of argue for who gets to be vice president, and we kind of figure this thing out together that Jesus finally is going to get us to the place where he announces his power, where he announces his title, where he shows up and does exactly what we'd hoped for. Until Jesus gets arrested, and Jesus is persecuted, that Jesus is falsely convicted, that Jesus is tortured, and ultimately, as we know on this side of the cross, he's put to death. And his disciples, confused and stunned, think to themselves, this is not how this was supposed to go. This is not how the story is supposed to end. We had so much expectation, and now, well, now what? What do we do now? Where do we place our hope, and where do we place our faith? And my guess is that for some of you watching, that 
that might be the place where you find yourself. That you might have built up hope and maybe, just maybe, there's something that I can finally be hopeful for. That after season after season of wondering what God is like, that maybe, just maybe, this could be the place. And maybe you've attended church in the past. Maybe this is brand new to you, but you're wondering, could this be the real thing? On Easter, oftentimes, we focus in on the death of Jesus, but ultimately, the death of Jesus didn't really prove much. There were many Messiah figures that had come in the past. There's still some that even claim to be today, but but here's what we know is that oftentimes they died, and we don't know their name on the other side of things. We don't know their mark in history. We don't celebrate them 2,000 years in the future. Why? Because it wasn't Jesus' death that we celebrate. It's the fact that he rose again three days later. That is the That is the foundation of our beliefs. In fact, our faith is not based on Jesus' death. Our faith centers around Jesus' resurrection. And that's really what I want to unpack today is why is this idea of a resurrection so powerful or challenging? What makes this resurrection concept so big? I mean, obviously it's a big deal if someone can call and pull off their own resurrection. That's pretty significant, that's powerful, that proves something, but there's something so much bigger at play that I think we realize. Theologian Philip Yancey said this, I thought this was just so powerful. In many respects, I find an unresurrected Jesus easier to accept. Easter makes him dangerous. Because of Easter, I have to listen to his extravagant claims and can no longer pick and choose from his sayings. Moreover, Easter means that he must be loose out there somewhere. The fact that Jesus died but didn't stay dead brings validity to his teachings, that Jesus now all of a sudden isn't a guy with catchy sayings, cool parables that could grab big crowds, and and kind of an egomaniac who pulled off some magic tricks. That's not what he is anymore. He's not even the person with noble causes who pioneered things like equality and women's rights, that he began to change so much of culture, things that we accept as normative today, Jesus was on the forefront of. And that would make him noble, but that wouldn't make him worthy of our worship. It's the fact that Jesus proved himself to be God to not just his followers, but his skeptics. That is what makes him worthy. The resurrection is what changes everything. And today, for the the next little bit of time that we have remaining, I want to unpack just three things. I believe it did so much more, but there's three big pillars that because of the resurrection and standing on the other side of it, that I think we can discover something so real and so different about what faith could mean, that God, who created all things, created you and me, would look for a personal relationship with us, then rather than seeing the resurrection of Jesus as the triumphant end of the story, what if we saw it as just the beginning? Just the beginning of the master plan that God had put into work so long before to restore relationship with you and me. If we start to realize the implications of the resurrection, I think the way we view our faith could change. So whether you have been following Jesus for a long time and church isn't a new thing for you and you've been to a million different Easter services or this is a whole new brand new conversation for you, I think Jesus would want to speak something to us today. I think he'd want to reveal some truth today. And maybe we could start to to take our faith and see it in a brand new light. Because of the resurrection, I think we find some incredible things. The first thing is this. Because of the resurrection, law became grace. Law became grace. Law has an important feature. Law is, is crucial around here. I'm glad there are some laws. I think they set boundaries. They set expectations. And they also set consequences. That's what law does. But it's interesting, Jesus doesn't lean into the legalistic side. If you were to ask people on the streets, just take a straw poll to describe Christianity, I guarantee legalistic would come up in there somewhere, but it's interesting to see what Jesus said when it comes to the law. The law, usually referencing the Old Testament of the first half, the original covenant that God had with the nation of Israel, he gave them a law, but Jesus seems to replace the law and bring something new. Here's what he says in the book of Luke. This is important. Law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. The law and the prophets, these are important things, but they 
they had their time. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached. And everyone is forcing their way into it. The good news of the kingdom of God, that is the new thing. That's the new thing that Jesus is doing. And I just want to, I just want to tell you for just a second, if, if you've maybe been around church before, maybe you've been around a service, maybe you've even heard about the claims of Jesus, and it hasn't been categorized to you as good news, if you've thought of it and you've thought, man, that's a lot of things, but I wouldn't call it good news, then maybe you're not hearing the the gospel that Jesus preached. Maybe you're not hearing the teachings of Jesus at all, because as you read through Scripture, as you see what Jesus taught, and even you see what he did, it's good news. It's the kingdom of God moving forward in a way that, well, we could have never expected. It begins to change things, and Jesus demonstrated what he taught in a way that oftentimes we can't even begin to understand. If we look in the book of Luke and we catch up a little bit later, in fact, right as Jesus is is on his way to be crucified, he exemplifies this concept of grace in a way that really just blows my mind to even think about. In Luke 23, it says this, When they came to the place called the Skull, or Golgotha, they crucified him there, talking about Jesus, along with the criminals. One on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Catch this picture for just a moment. Uh, After being wrongly accused, after being tortured, and ultimately put up to be crucified, it doesn't really describe the crucifixion because I think in this time, everyone there would have understood how gruesome it is. They've walked past one. They've avoided one. They've covered their kids' eyes as they walked near one. It's like trying to explain a dental cleaning today. We don't have to do that. I don't have to explain the process. You've experienced it, so you know. In the same way, they don't really explain what a crucifixion is, but man, the the power and the gravity of this, it was It was something that would take your breath away. And Jesus, in the midst of what many would consider the worst day in anyone's life, looks at the people who have wrongly accused him, who are currently casting lots and gambling on who would take his clothes. And and he said, Lord, they don't know what they're doing. Would you bring forgiveness to them in that moment? If that's the way that God is categorized, does that sound like a vindictive or spiteful God? Does that sound like a God who's, who's just trying to catch you in the worst moment of your life? Or does that sound like a God who would maybe lead with grace and compassion? Who would look to you and look to me and believe for something even greater? That would, that would demonstrate his faith and really bring forgiveness in a way that no one had ever understood. Oftentimes, religion and faith is based on this give-and-take principle that if I obey and if I do and if I act correctly, if it's based on merit and progress and performance, and that's the way I receive favor. What, what changes in this moment is that Jesus says, no, 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 it's not about performance or obligation, but rather it's about a gift that's given freely It's grace. It's hope. It's something that we can count on, and it's not because Jesus died, but because we find hope in his resurrection. The second thing that we see is this, is that because of the resurrection, death became life. And I I get what you're thinking. Yeah, isn't that the crux of what a resurrection is? It's death becoming life, but there's something so much bigger in that. As we continue on in the story of Jesus' crucifixion, here's what we see. In Luke 23, the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah. If he's the chosen one, let's see him act. Let's see him do something about it. And to be honest, this is usually where something would happen. If I were scripting the story, it's exactly like every action movie you've ever seen. The hero gets to the lowest of lows where it seems like no hope, but they muster a strength that no one knew was possible, and they overcome the enemy, and everyone cheers, and right off into the sunset. And that's what the people expected, the lowest of lows where it seemed like nothing else was possible. This is the moment where Jesus is supposed to really flex his power. This is where he's supposed to come in might. Isn't this what he's supposed to do is 
is to save himself. But I think Jesus knew that there was something bigger at play. I think Jesus knew this, that um, Jesus knew if he would have saved himself, he would have forfeit the chance to save us. Because for whatever reason, a sacrifice had to be made. If I'm scripting it, and if it, was, if it just came down to a demonstration of power, I don't think it would have taken very long. I think Jesus would have come with that intention right away. He would have flexed some power. He would have established himself king. If the goal was to be right or to win, he could have done that very, very quickly. It, it would have been so much easier. He would have done it right away from the beginning. But it seems as though some sacrifice was required, that something bigger was needed to bridge the gap. And honestly, if you have a conversation with 10 different theologians, you're probably going to get 10 different answers why. And I wish I had a clear and definitive response to why the sacrifice of Jesus was necessary, but I don't have one. What I do know is that it was. It was needed because to go to this extent, to go to this ends, to go through all of this for no purpose— when it could have been different, when it could have been easier, I, I just can't see it. But for some reason, this was needed. For some reason, we needed to see death become life. We needed to see um, that this was something that God was in the habit of doing, that, that part of God's character and who he was um, really reflects this idea that death could become Life. Here's what we see in 2 Corinthians. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. What was wronged, what was dead, what needed life, what, what needed change happened through the grace of Jesus. In that though you and I, we've never experienced earthly death, my guess is that we've experienced death in a number of different ways. That we've experienced loss, that we've experienced um, the death of a dream, the death of a relationship, the death of a loved one, the death of a passion. I don't know what it is for you, but Jesus is in the business of bringing redemption, bringing hope, and bringing a future. And if you're watching today and you're wondering, man, if you knew my story, if you knew what I've done, if you know what I've been through, then you wouldn't be saying stuff like that. I think that's exactly the truth that God would want to speak to you is that what seems dead could be brought to life once more. I remember when I was a kid, uh, we had these kind of cassettes on tape, and uh, you would do a cassette on tape, and it, it would kind of be a book on tape, and you would follow along with a little kid's book, and it would read the story and every once in a while, it kind of prepped you in the beginning, you would hear this chime, and it would say, turn the page. Chime and turn the page. And I couldn't really read at this age, and so I knew my job was holding the book, waiting for the chime, and turning the page. And I don't know, it might sound cheesy or cliche, but today might be the opportunity where you need a message like this, you need to hear hope like this to just be reminded, to be rattled and stirred that may, maybe you don't understand it all, but God is looking to you and saying, it's time, it's time to turn the page. It's time to move forward to something new that though things might seem dead and hopeless, that the page can be turned to something new and that through God's Spirit, through His hope, through the resurrection power of Jesus, that we might turn death to life once more, that we might see something that we never expected. In fact, this tension between death and life is exemplified in the most popular verse, probably in history, definitely the most popular verse at, at sporting events. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish or die or be outside of relationship with God, but have eternal life. There's this tension that's brought up, and I don't know how it all works. I don't understand it. I hope Jesus explains it in heaven. The arithmetic doesn't always make sense, but, but it seems as though Jesus' sacrifice of himself, that God's sending his son into the world, took the, evened the score, provided the sacrifice that we need to be in right relationship once more, that things that once were dead could be brought to life once again. In fact, I want you to just hear this, if you hear nothing else, that God proves that it is in his character to bring life to things that once thought dead. There's things that we think to be dead in our lives or in this world, but God is just waiting eagerly to bring life to. 
In fact, a uh, practical application that we have is baptism. It's an incredible opportunity that we, uh, we love to see. It's, it's a thing that we can participate in. In fashion like Jesus was brought once again to life, we see baptism as the opportunity that when you go under the water, your old life is gone and you are brought up anew, that a new life begins. It's, it's really a public demonstration of a personal faith. It's a personal decision that we made, but we announce it publicly through the act of baptism. And in just two weeks, we're having a Next Step Sunday that I would love, if you've never taken the practical step of being baptized and you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus, I'm not saying that you have everything memorized or it all figured out yet, but you're saying, I want to try and follow Jesus with my life and you've never been baptized, I would highly recommend, go over to the website, sign up, we'd love to help, ask, answer any questions that you may have, and uh, I challenge you to take this next step in your faith. It's a great opportunity to make that public declaration of a personal faith, to really, uh, in this powerful way, symbolize and demonstrate that, that God's character is working in me. Once what was dead is now brought to life, that hope, well, hope is, is possible. And that brings us to our last point, is because of the resurrection, hope became possible. That law became grace that death became life and ultimately hope, well, hope became possible. Over the past few years, if you're like me, you've had many opportunities with glimmers of hope. Hope that things would once again be normal, even though they're still challenging. Hope that things might get easier, but they haven't. Hope that things would change in a way for the better, but it seems like they're not. And every time it feels like we have these little glimmers of hope, frustratingly enough, they never seem to materialize. And maybe that's where you're at with your faith, is that you can be hopeful, but it just doesn't feel like it's really come together. What's amazing is that the disciples felt the exact same way, that, that empirically all hope had been lost. But wouldn't you know it? Hope didn't stay in the grave. That hope ultimately was resurrected. That God provided a pathway that we could once again have hope in who Jesus is. Oftentimes we read the Bible and we think, wasn't that nice for that time that Jesus was doing then? But what I need you to hear is that Jesus is still doing now what he was doing then. Faith acknowledges that who Jesus was, he still is today. What he is capable of doing then, he is capable of doing now. That Jesus did not end and it was not finished, but instead it simply began the things that were to come. And one of my favorite verses uh, in all of the Bible, we see this hope in action. We see this hope applied. We see this in Romans 8, 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Now, it's not because of what you did. It's not because you earned it or you deserved it. No, 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 that would have been law, but instead grace came in its place. And it's not because um, that dead things stay dead. No, 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 no. The same Spirit lives in you. Just as God brought Christ from the dead, he will give life to your world, that death could become life. And ultimately, because of this hope, well, hope seems to materialize finally. That hope, though oftentimes seems distant and far away, could be personal and practical. There's a passage in the book of Matthew that we see um, this incredible account that uh, in a physical demonstration of, I think, the the beauty of what Jesus' death and re resurrection represents. In the temple at the time, there was a large curtain, about 12 inches thick, went from floor to ceiling. I mean, this thing was gigantic. And its role and function was to separate the Holy of Holies, where God dwelled, from the outer courts and where people were. What's unbelievable is that in the account of Matthew, we see that this, this curtain was torn and it wasn't torn from the bottom as if two people just got together and pulled really hard and tore it. But instead, the Bible says it was torn from top to bottom. That it was torn from the top and ultimately came to the bottom, symbolizing that God is at work, bridging the relationship once more, that he is no longer confined to a space or a place or a law, but instead that he is open 
inaccessible. It changed everything. That Jesus' death and ultimately his resurrection cemented a new covenant, a new hope that not just one select group of people or based on where you were born or raised or taught or the culture that you were brought up in, those were no longer the qualifiers. It's people who were eagerly seeking to follow Jesus, to place their trust in something bigger than themselves, to look to their heavenly Father and say, your kingdom come, your will be done, not just in this earth, but in my life that I'm no longer in control trying to manufacture my own outcomes, but instead I can lean on your grace, that I no longer have to find myself hopeless and dead inside, but instead I could receive your life and your spirit and ultimately find a hope, a peace, a joy, and a contentment that I didn't even know was possible. That is the story of Easter. That is the story that doesn't disappoint. That's the story that lives up to the expectation and, in fact, blows it away. And today, I don't know where you might find yourself in a relationship with God. For some of you, this might be encouragement of things you already know. It could be a reminder that God is near and He is not far. It might just be a challenge to to draw near on your own, that this season God might want to be doing something new that you've never expected. But for some, I also realize this could be brand new. That this is not the version of God's story that you were told. The story that you were told involved a lot of guilt and a lot of shame, involved a lot of law and very little grace. But remember, the good news of the kingdom of God is here. It is advancing, and people are forcing their way in. Maybe you're at a place where you would say, you know what, I want in. I want this hope to seem possible. I want the dead things in my life to once again find life, that they were just dormant all along, that God was waiting eagerly to bring life, and life more abundant than you could have ever expected. Listen, on the cross, Jesus made his opinion about you abundantly clear, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, because that's in his character. His character is to bring death to life, to once again bring a relationship back to his creation, to you and to me. Would you do me a favor, regardless of where you're at or who's around, would you just take a moment and set down the jelly beans and bow your head and close your eyes? I think what this does is it just settles our senses a little bit and maybe gives an opportunity for God to speak in a way that we didn't expect. If you're watching online and you think to yourself, you know what, I, I want that relationship with God. I want Him to be near in my life. I want His grace and His forgiveness. You could do this simple thing. You could just simply pray this prayer along with me. The words are simple. The implications are profound. That God would be near once again. That His resurrection would have the power to overcome and do things we never knew possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus. We pray in this moment that the same spirit that brought him to life would bring us to life as well. That your spirit would dwell within us. God, we eagerly hunt for a relationship with you. Would you forgive us of our sins? Would you Would you acknowledge that our past is behind us? And God, would you give us the vision and courage to chase a future following you? We don't understand it all. We don't have all the answers. But Jesus, would you bring a clarity in the way that only you can? Would you bring hope? Would you bring your peace, your contentment, and your joy in this season in a way we've never expected? God, would you reveal the next steps of our life, whether it be baptism whether it simply be attending church and leaning in more, whether it be picking up a Bible and reading of your son Jesus, whatever it may be, God, would you reveal it to us, give us the strength to do it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, to all of you that maybe prayed this prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, congratulations 
and happy Easter to you. Welcome to the family here at Ballard Church. We'd love to celebrate you with you if you feel comfortable. Um, you can go ahead and fill out a Connect card on our website. Just let us know that you made that decision today. We'll help you with any questions or next steps or ways that you can get involved here at Ballard Church. But for all of us here at Ballard Church, happy Easter, uh, and, and we celebrate with you today. Not because Jesus died on a cross, but because he rose once again. And that is a reason to celebrate. Happy Easter. God bless you guys.